all these things we understand, but we seem to lack the power to change our minds, or if we have that power, then the power to change other people's minds. And I, I am into psychedelics, not because I think it's a sure thing, but because I think it is the only game in town. In other words, it's the only thing I've ever seen change an individual on a time scale similar to the time scale that we have if we're going to make a difference. I've seen over and over again, I'm sure many of you have, people go into a psychedelic jerks and come out halfway decent human beings, uh, you know, eight hours later. <laughs> If we had 500 years to steer global society into safe harbor, it might be possible to do that. But we don't. I mean, I really believe that we are being asked to participate in the birthing of a new order of being. And that there is reason for great optimism and hope. What I thought I would talk about uh, when I was approached to do this, uh, the pressure was to say something new, which is uh, a heart-sinking pressure to a war horse of the lecture circuit. I started out thinking I would never repeat myself and sometimes wonder if I'll ever have a new idea again. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about this evening was illusions. And I called the lecture the taxonomy of illusion because I think it's interesting to, uh, to attempt to classify and relate the various kinds of illusions that stand between us and uh, that presupposed naked radiant truth. <laughs> that has more or less driven the engines of Western philosophy since, uh, since Plato. Of course, the great victory of modernity is to disabuse ourselves of such naive notions, but uh, they die hard, I think. Uh, Ralph mentioned my, uh, my latest book, and I, didn't, I don't intend to talk about the book particularly, but I, in the book, I quote a, uh, the only piece of poetry in the whole thing, not written by me. I now see that I seem to have lost it. Oh no, here it comes up. But it relates to this on many, many levels, this question of illusion and the relationship of the self to the real and where the world falls in that equation and the limits of knowledge and all that other good psychedelic stuff that needs to be considered. Um, the quote is from Pale Fire by Vladimir Nabokov and if you don't know this book you should. It is without doubt one of the funniest books in the English language and it takes the form of a very long poem and then the commentary upon this poem. The poem is written by a character that Nabokov creates named John Shade. And uh, the part that I want to call to your attention this evening runs like this. That rare phenomenon, the iridule, when beautiful and strange, in a bright sky above a mountain range, one opal cloudlet in an oval form reflects the rainbow of a thunderstorm which in a distant valley has been staged, for we are most artistically caged. Now, this is a very strange piece of poetry. This is not like uh, even Wallace Stevens it is most obscure. In the first place, this word, 
the iridule. You won't find this word in any dictionary. And yet I sensed that uh, this is obviously the word for this phenomenon. Uh, I, I know what he's talking about. I have seen uh, this uh, opal cloudlet in an oval form which reflects the rainbow of a thunderstorm in a distant place. We're here, we're in the realm of mirage and nature as mirage and nature as mirrored labyrinth. Uh, and then the final point, and I'll go through all this in the course of talking to you, but the final line about being artistically caged, this is, I think, um, where the psychedelics come in. Because psychedelics allow one to pierce beyond the veil of cultural illusion, beyond the linguistic momentum of what has been handed on, what has been handed on. The faith of Tantra and magic and psychedelics is that the apparent intransient, uh, intransigent appearance of the world can somehow be overcome by an act of magic. I used to collect uh, Tibetan tonkas and the texts which go with some of these tonkas. I remember one in particular which coming out of the Tibetan, the translation was all things being reversed, the great Hua, the great God, appears instantly. You see, the precondition for magic is the reversal of causality somehow. And as moderns, we have grown to give great credence, I think, to the idea that the world is largely a linguistic structure, largely created through the participation of the observer. But we have not been able to take that perception and turn it into a technology. Instead, we are still driven by uh, the blind momentum of atomic structure. Who was it who said uh, the atoms blindly run? And then I think it was Whitehead who said, yes, but within the body they blindly run according to the body's plan. You see, what, what I think we're dealing with are patterns and then the indeterminate dimensions between patterns. And it's in those indeterminate places within the interstices of reality that the observer is able to establish him or herself and then model back uh, the world. The reason I wanted to talk about a taxonomy of illusion was because I thought it was important to relate the various styles of hyper-seeing, non-seeing, and miss-seeing together, because I think that the, the heuristic consequences of doing that are to realize just how shifting the sands are upon which the ontological edifice of Western thinking rests. I mean, that's always the point, you see, to deconstruct Western civilization, because Western civilization, the toxic consequences are now clear for everyone to see. So the first, uh, the first category or grand family of illusions which we would put into our taxonomic key would be social illusions. And when I, and, and uh, you know, later we can argue this, but at, at this point in the, in the discussion, illusion is slash delusion. So the great social illusions, delusions, are sexism, racism, xenophobia, 
egoism, so for, uh, classism. The world is riddled and ruled by these social illusions and no one is free of them. And so they constitute one broad category. I might just mention as an aside a book which was very influential on me and I never heard anybody else ever mention it was a, a book called by Rockcliffe called Illusions and Delusions of the Supernatural and the Occult. Uh, this was a 19th century book which I as a kid got in a Dover reprint and it was in a wonderful era where the study of anomalies was still young and so this book had everything poured in together from Mesmer's ectoplasm to people who had tumors that they carried around in wheelbarrows to birds that did advanced arithmetic uh, so forth and so on <clears throat> and it was a very very much from the point of view of Victorian rationalism and it also mentioned psychedelics. It was what it really was, was a category of edges, and, uh, or a catalog of edges, I'm sorry. And uh, it's only then in the subsequent uh, 40, 35 years that that Wunderkamera approach to illusion and I assume you all know what I mean by that. I mean I'm referring to the era before the rise of Linnaean natural science when uh, naturalists would simply fill cabinets with anomalous, fascinating, and strange objects. So the tarantulas might be mixed in with the chambered nautiluses which might be stirred into the Zuni fetishes which might be next to the something else. Then later these vunakamaras, these uh, curiosity cabinets as you would call them in English, gave way to Linnaean taxonomy. In the same way over the past hundred years I think the study of illusion an anomaly has uh, attempted to rationalize itself. Uh, spatial illusions are an entirely different family of illusory phenomena and we all have encountered at some level, I imagine, the, the specially constructed environments that occur in behavioral uh, psychology labs that trick you into thinking that the person in the foreground is smaller than the person in the background and so forth and so on. These kinds uh, of illusions and are, are uh, probably fairly trivial except that they address perception. And when we get to psychedelics as a source of illusion, this is uh, more important. Another of the great family of illusions are, uh, in thinking about them, I call them ontological illusions. Illusions of states of being which may or may not in fact be reflected in reality. Uh, UFOs, Bigfoot, uh, crop circles, uh, Mm, the entire panoply of poltergeist phenomena and this sort of thing, ontological illusions. And these are very interesting. I mean, one could give time to this alone uh, because there are persistent ontological illusions in the human sensorium, such as an angels, elves, demons, jinns, afrites, nixies, and sprites, that crowd. And there are ontological illusions that seem somehow tied to the evolving modalities of the group mind. Uh, UFOs are an obvious example. I mean, aside from the fact that people have occasionally seen strange things in the sky, the UFO archetype really emerges in the late 40s with the, the Rainier lights and then a, a whole set of um, taxonomic features of this particular brand of illusion 
uh, coalesce the silvery disks, uh, the, the alien denizens with the cat eyes and the rubbery flesh, those same guys who give you unscheduled proctological examinations <laughs> in the middle of the night. Uh, but notice that that particular taxonomic feature has been added recently uh, through the uh, assiduously careful scientific research of uh, Strieber and company. So uh, these things are in a, in a, in a uh, well, a cattle mutilation is an interesting one, very confined in time and space. The, the crop circle thing um, similarly. It's not that uh, there aren't crop circles, but that what we have is essentially a pattern in an English wheat field, but then radiating out from that are the illusions of those who cast their gaze upon it, those who proclaim it, uh, you know, telluric communication, or particle beam research carried on by the Air Force, or in one version it was supposed it was supposed that a particular crop circle had been decoded, found to be a lost Sumerian language, which when decoded said basically, don't stop here. It was essentially a no parking zone for time machines. They were saying, you know, this entire century just to maintain speed and, uh, <clears throat> you know, do not <laughs> stop. Um, psychedelic illusions, uh, again, this is a related category but different from these ontological illusions. Uh, by illusion, I mean that uh, uh, these are uh, confrontations with phenomena, an apparently subjective ground and an, and an assumed rational observer where then there is a more than ordinary amount of ambiguity. I mean, most of reality is illusory. It's just that we do each other the courtesy of not pointing this out. Uh, you know, actually you, you trace a very thin data path through the world and most of what we assume without question we have very little evidence for. I mean, something as simple as, uh, well, like that Mount Everest is the highest mountain in the world. Well, first of all, very few people have ever seen it. Uh, I saw it, and because I saw it from a distance of about 500 miles, it looked quite small, and my own testimony as to whether it was the highest mountain in the world did, be fairly unreliable and besides what does that mean anyhow and how the hell do you figure it out? I mean here we have one uh, mountain in the Himalayas and another in Bolivia and you're telling me you know which is the higher mountain? It must rest on a whole bunch of weird and fishy assumptions resting on even shakier data. So, and that's just the question of the highest mountain in the world. Give or, you know, leave alone the state of your lover's heart or your bankers for that matter. <laughs> What's important about the psychedelic family of illusions is that they uh, propel the entire issue of illusion to center stage because they demonstrate that the uh, uh, assumed bedrock of quote-unquote ordinary perception is in fact no, no bedrock at all. It's simply a very soft uh, dwell point somewhere in the mysteries of metabolism. And the, the consciousness, whatever its relationship to the brain, is spectacularly affected by the perturbation of the physical brain by uh, endogenously introduced pseudo-neurotransmitters of some sort. And to my mind, 
this is very interesting. You know, uh, Alexander Shulgin has secured in his work that you can take a molecule that is completely inactive and by moving one atom to a different place on the ring, you can change this into an active compound. Now, it seems to me you could hardly have a neater demonstration of the quantum mechanical foundation of consciousness because you've moved one atom and you've uh, moved the mountains of mind 500 miles from where they were resting when last you looked. It's quite spectacular. And it argues then that mind which, strangely enough, the materialists always claim this. They just put different emphasis on the words. Mind is a kind of iridescence upon metabolism. For the materialists, that was a dismissal. Because to them, what iridescence meant was a tertiary phenomenon, not inimical to the structure of matter, but necessarily perceived only through the intercession of an observer. See, that's what iridescence is. It's somehow a more fragile part of nature than the rocks, the trees, and the waters, because it's a play between light and mind. Again, a kind of illusion, a mirage. Now, in a very different category of illusion, and this is one uh, worth considering because it's the one we tend not to place in this category. And that is the illusion of materialism. This has broken down completely. Uh, the idea that the material world was real sustained the investigation of nature from Parmenides to the early years of the 20th century. Virtually the entire history of human engagement in, intell in the abstract intellectual modeling of matter, matter was assumed to uh, be pretty much as presented in perception, solid, enduring, having simple location, meaning, you know, it is, it stays where you put it, and when you look there again, it's there. Uh, that sort of thing. Now, one of the best kept dirty secrets of Western civilization is that the core science, which is physics, the science which was always um, the envy of all the other sciences for its mathematical formalism and its incredible uh, predictive ability because it's not unusual in physics to predict from theory an experimental result to the third or fourth decimal. This is spectacular congruence between uh, theory and experiment. You don't get that in the social sciences or even in physical uh, <laughs> need I mention. Uh, uh, or even in physical chemistry. However, the investigation of matter has now been pushed to such extremes that matter has shed its easily recognized and familiar face and it has become something much slipperier, much more dependent on the presence of the observer, much uh, less easily located in space and time, something much more of the nature of thought than, uh, than of the familiar conception of matter. This word has not reached even as far as biology yet. The biologists are still laboring under the notion of the reality of physical material. Uh, if any of you read this book that was published last year with much uh, to do called Consciousness Explained, uh, actually it should have been called Consciousness Explained Away. Uh, here, here was an effort to drag out all the old material paradigms and uh, 
explain away consciousness. The problem is uh, matter itself has taken on the qualities of mind. And uh, as this realization relativizes uh, the life sciences, I think there is going to be uh, a new interest in the potential for psychedelics to elucidate uh, mental functioning. Because what will become respectable, you see, is talk of the observer. This is what has invaded physics, the most rarefied and formal of all the sciences, had in order to make sense of its enterprise, uh, allow the observer a kind of primacy with the thing observed. As this seeps into the life sciences and psychology, hopefully the phobia of actually involving yourself in your field of study that informs all these reductionist to ratomorphic types in the schools of psychology uh, will be overturned. Well, uh, having flayed that dead horse sufficiently, uh, the, uh, uh, another category of illusion that needs to be addressed, I think, is, um, um, how would one call it? Well, basically a uh, philosophical illusion or philosophical slash religious illusion. This is the idea <coughs> that by a direct appeal to intuition, we can somehow gain um, a foothold on truth. I think this is as specious as the notion that we can gain a foothold on truth <coughs> through reason or experiment. This foothold on truth idea may have to be given up. Uh, I'm sure some of you have heard me recall uh, the situation where Wittgenstein was raving about something and one of his students said, but is it the truth? And he said, well, it's true enough. <laughs> and uh, this is really a, means a great divide has been crossed when you can say that because it means you understand now that you are no longer a, a, a fairy in a platonic super world, but that you are actually a monkey with a brain full of mush trying to sort out, uh, you know, what's right in front of you. True enough <laughs> is, is what we should probably rest with. And, you know, uh, illusions abound. Uh, one, for instance, uh, I was speaking of these religious ontologies. Uh, I was talking to someone recently who amazed me because I've always thought of them as uh, a person of great intelligence but who would never be reclaimed from the arms of Mother Church. And uh, we had dinner last week and he said, I realized it finally comes down to, do you believe the universe is being run by the ghost of a Galilean politician? And he said, you know, put that way, I realized that it wasn't. Uh, other other uh, religious myths are less easily undone, I think. Uh, <laughs> Monotheism has an appealing philosophical neatness, but it leads apparently to cholidorectomy. So, you know, you want to watch that. Uh, this, this search for philosophical neatness may make for uh, strange bedfellows. Uh, and of course, Buddhism, uh, I love the illusion of Buddhism, it's the illusion that illusion can be transcended. <clears throat> and uh, again, uh, not really doing genuflection to the animal nature. It's amazing to me. I mean, if you were to meet a termite 
who stated that his or her uh, goal in life was the perfect modeling of the cosmos, you would think it was quite a comic undertaking. Uh, and yet, how different are we that we should presume uh, uh, to more than a shadow of, of uh, a shadow of the truth? Well then, uh, finally, or I don't know, finally, but completing my laundry list here, um, linguistic truth, or the truth of language and the illusions that language weaves. Because uh, someone quite intelligent said uh, language was invented so that people could lie. In other words, it, it gives you that fudge factor of obfuscation where someone says, you know, why did you do that? Well, the best approach is, I didn't do that. You know, you, you thought I did that. What you thought you saw, you didn't see. In other words, uh, I suppose the, that uh, lawyers are probably the people who have done the finest work with language uh, and, and behind them politicians and the true potential for language to elevate and to unite the community was early on betrayed into the production of, um, of illusion, illusory and ideological goods which could then be marketed among the people and uh, to spread confusion. Psychedelics reflect on this because psychedelics stretch and pull and melt and recast the illusion producing machinery of language. I mean, I think that if you had to say the one thing that psychedelics do for everyone, whether they have a good trip or a bad trip, because it's up to them to interpret what they make of this, is it shows you the relativity of your cultural viewpoint. You know? That it's just, a, it's just your point of view. You inherited it from a, a, geolo a geographical area, a culture, a set of parents. It has no relationship whatsoever to anything anchored in some kind of metaphysical superspace. It's just your cultural point of view. And travel actually does the same thing. And I've always felt there was a weird affinity between psychedelics and travel. And I suppose many people have, or we wouldn't call it a trip. And, uh, you know, we wouldn't call it a journey. But travel shows you the relativity of culture. And what's really happening when you travel, you see, is you're moving from one language domain to another. We don't think of it that way, but that is in fact what is happening. You can never see the Amazon jungle if you keep intact the bubble of linguistic assumptions of the place you started out from. Every place will withhold its secrets from you. I learned this in the Amazon because the first time I went, I had virtually no botany. And to me, the jungle was green. That's what it was. And it was many shades of green, and it was beautiful, and it was this and that, but it was basically green. The second time I went, I was with a, a lot of botanists. And within days, you know, you learn the families. That's how they do it. With the same taxonomy I'm here applying to illusion was really developed to describe plants and animals. So you learn the families, the plants with square stems, the plants with the opposed leaves, the plants uh, with the particular flower structure. Once you know families, then you have a linguistic wedge in, uh, but you know the, cure, the, the corrupting or curious thing about language is that like all tools, it shapes its user 
in ways that are not suspected until it's too late. So, uh, in, for instance, the way in which Western civilization is totally obsessed with the subject-object relationship, you know, and it's the basis of our science, our polity, our relations to commerce, the concept of product, all of these things come out of the subject-object relationship, which is an aspect of language. Uh, in the, so I, I point all this out because uh, in talking about my new book, somebody said that I had gone too far. <laughs> and I was amused because it implied from what, you know? It's not like there is a King's X where uh, gray beards in white coats tend the sacred vestal fires of reality. <laughs> there is no reality. There are only people who know this and people who don't know this and are therefore being manipulated by the people who do know it. <laughs> this is true or true enough. <laughs> and, uh, you know, one of the things that has amazed me uh, with my own personal career, because, you know, I started out basically shoveling snow in a cow town in Colorado, and by fate or who knows what, uh, come to the present position and what I notice as I tra traverse levels uh, on a supposed ladder of success where you would expect uh, there to be more and more competition and people and activity actually it gets emptier and emptier uh, there is nobody minding the store as far as I can tell. This is why I'm so unsympathetic to conspiracy theory. We could use a few conspiracies. Nobody is minding the store. Everybody is getting rich, personally rich. And so they don't have time for, you know, to advance the Aryan race or the Council of Zion or any of this fantasy an illusion that haunts the world of conspiracy theory. Uh, rather, it seems, uh, everything is being left pretty much to develop on its own because people are afraid to grab or touch the levers and buttons in the control room of the historical vehicle. Uh, and what that means then is that people who can cut through these many, many illusions. The illusion of materialism, the illusion of business as usual, the illusion of benevolent institutions carefully guiding us toward reasonable destinies. If you cut through all that, if you disabuse yourself of all that, uh, you, you will empower yourself to eventually be able to stand up in delicate social and political situations and just say, bullshit. <laughs> That's bullshit. And this is worth considering doing uh, simply because we have an imperiled planet on our hands. We have been for a long, long time the victims of illusion. Western civilization, Stefan Daedalus was right. History is a nightmare from which one must awaken, quite literally. I mean, we have been blind to what we have been doing. We are blind at this moment to what we are doing. If in a single moment the actual nature of our predicament were to fully make itself felt in the mind of any one of us, I think it would be paralyzing. It would be horrifying. 
We, we have waited till the last moment of the last hour. The house is burning down around us and we rouse ourselves from the stupor of materialism, the stupor of Christianity and scientism, the stupor of male dominance, sexism and racism, if we don't rouse ourselves from this stupor, the momentum toward extinction is now practically irreversible. You know, the Grateful Dead like to sing that song, we need a miracle every day. We certainly, uh, we certainly do. Because, with, and, and so then that brings me back to my original point, that the moment that outside the then of culture lies an unmapped terra incognito as vast as the new world was to the old in the 15th century as vast as outer space appears to us now the new world outside of culture is a world that can be conquered through vision and language and you know many of you have sat through my recitations of what it's like to smoke DMT many of you I'm sure are familiar with the the medieval woodcut of the guy sticking his head through the cogs and wheels of the cosmic machinery to observe a new world outside the message here is and it's, it, it's more than a message. It's a message if you just come to events like this and then go back to studying cost accounting. It's an experience, if you will, but avail yourselves of these tools. The experiences of the discovery of a new world. A new world as real as any world that we know. It's not going to come from Time Magazine or the Secretary General of the United Nations or anybody like that. It's, it isn't that the world is tired and played out and that all frontiers have been explored. Every culture could support that viewpoint it, it, within certain classes and in certain situations. But in fact, it has never been true, and it isn't true now. We are monkeys, and monkeys love a hell of a good fight. And we have a hell of a fight bearing down on us because we have to clean up the mess. We are going to, eat. we're not going to go silently into the gentle night of extinction. There, it, it, it's just not going to happen that way. Creativity is going to be unleashed. Struggle is going to be uh, an unavoidable part of trying to steer this battleship away from the cataracts of history in which we are now caught. Uh, I, I believe that it, there is a tremendous obligation upon the privileged classes of the high-tech industrial democracies, and I dare say that includes everyone in this room, a tremendous obligation to attempt to deconstruct the bomb that we have inherited. And that is literally our situation. The gift from the past from the 19th century, from the 1940s, from the psychology of, uh, of Nixon and Johnson and that crowd, is uh, a ticking bomb, except that it's a planet. And it's the greatest challenge to intelligence that intelligence has ever faced. And yet it's precisely the kind of challenge that intelligence should be able to meet because what it requires is large-scale strategic planning, implementation of visionary responses. It is not incremental. It's sudden, complete, and dramatic. And I really believe that uh, there will only be one chance. You know, it's we are circling the runway of post-history. 
and the engines are running low and they, there is one approach and then you know if you miss that approach you're into the drink now we can use we have the great good fortune to be approaching the end of a millennium would it be redundant to say this only happens once in a thousand years yes <laughs> And it's extraordinarily fortunate. Once I was in England and I ran into somebody I hadn't seen for 20 years. And I was amazed and I said to Rupert, how often do, does one get a chance to meet someone one hasn't seen for 20 years? And he said, well, I dare say, I suppose every 20 years or so. <laughs> we can use the millennium this, uh, this apparent coincidence of our dilemma and a calendrical turning point to uh, create awareness of opportunity. And we can use the psychedelics to dissolve boundaries between ourselves and other people, between institutions that govern and the govern. And basically, we have to insist on the seriousness of the situation and the potential for solutions. And what it means is a much more radical break with American society than we've been willing to contemplate uh, in the last 20 years. We, we went through this thing with, you know, the two-term governor of Arkansas and it took a year and a half to play that all out and to see what it comes to. And what it comes to is, you know, Washington is convulsed over the possibility of closing an air base near Sacramento. So how can we even conceive of this government making an impact on the real problems. It is still government by flim flam. And that would be all very well if we had 500 years to dig ourselves out of this dilemma. But if, there, if a radical political alternative is not opened up in this country, then we are essentially, I think, going to uh, amuse and entertain ourselves into extinction. The ordinary orthodox system has failed. What Bill Clinton exists to prove at best is that people of goodwill make no difference in those institutions because they are compromised and corrupted from the very beginning. It's just the way it is. They, those institutions are set up for business as usual. Business as usual at this point is a death sentence on the human race. Uh, what has to be done is uh, a tribalizing of culture, uh, an ecstaticizing of culture, a dissolving of hierarchy, that means self-empowerment through claiming the new information technologies, through deconditioning from propaganda, through deconditioning uh, from uh, the pharmaphobia that holds everyone within the pre-programmed molds that are being handed down from Madison Avenue and Hollywood. It means actually realizing that your life is your own. Your destiny is your own. It isn't within the confines of the culture because the culture is dissolving. And to the degree that the word is put out, that phenomenon will accelerate. We are in an extraordinary transition. Everything that has worked now doesn't meaning global economic systems, control of the spread of epidemic disease, uh, and so forth and so on. All these systems are breaking down, and yet the new systems are not yet in place. So this is a situation of extraordinary malleability and a situation in which uh, people of great vision and great ego can make tremendous impact. 
So it's a very dangerous situation. We saw this in the 1930s in Germany and in Europe where there were all kinds of potentials, all kinds of possibilities. We forget how powerful a visionary Marxism was before the rise of fascism. Movements like Bauhaus and Dada and Surrealism all had agendas which, were, which disappeared then under the rise of fascism. This must not happen again. And what it has to do with is resisting images that are coming from the reality studio, resisting the images that are coming off the tube, coming through the newspapers, and creating a community based on psychedelics, sexuality, sensitivity, and good sense. Cultural value, and what good sense will mean in this situation is the preservation of the earth, the preservation of diversity, deconditioning from product fetishism, deconditioning from um, energy overconsumption, all these things we understand, but we seem to lack the power to change our minds or if we have that power, then the power to change other people's minds. And I, I am into psychedelics, not because I think it's a sure thing, but because I think it is the only game in town. In other words, it's the only thing I've ever seen change an individual on a time scale similar to the time scale that we have if we're going to make a difference. I've seen over and over again, I'm sure many of you have, people go into a psychedelic jerks and come out halfway decent human beings, uh, you know, eight hours later. <laughs> if we had 500 years to steer global society into safe harbor, it might be possible to do that, but we don't. I mean, I really believe that we are being asked to participate in the birthing of a new order of being and that there is reason for great optimism and hope because it looks like we're just boring into solid rock. But in fact, there's somebody else boring through that solid rock and they have triangulated our approach and they are hurrying to meet us. I don't think we fell into this situation because of bad fate or, or bad destiny. This is part of the process. History is what happens when an animal species an advanced animal falls under the influence of a transformative attractor of some sort. History is only about 25,000 years in duration. The interesting part in the last 5,000 years, what has happened is that something confounding has entered the local situation or was always dormant there, but has stirred to wakefulness. And it is not God, not the God that in Milton's wonderful phrase hung the lamps like stars in heaven. It isn't that God. Maybe it's the God of biology, but whatever it is, it is to us as we are to the termite. And what it is doing is it is casting an enormous transcendental shadow back through time over the epigenetic landscape of biological becoming. And in our species, for reasons mysterious to me, we mirror this thing and it has swung our compass away from the forward flow of genetic theme and variation and in a course orthogonal to biology, a course set on the transcendental and it is pulling us toward it 
through the medium of transforming our languages, through the medium of the imagination, which is, after all, this mysterious mental domain in which we are whispered to by angels, demons, gods, ancestors, aliens, and out of that intercourse, culture, self-transforming, shedding its face every hundred years, building on novelty, is ascending toward a reaching out toward the unspeakable. This has been going on, I think, for billions of years. It has obviously and incontrovertibly been going on since the advent of consciousness in the human species. And now we're there. We're in the final domain of the confrontation with the secret. It is impossible to conceive of history going on for hundreds of years. It, the planet cannot sustain it. Uh, all of these uh, social structures and institutions that we have surrounded ourselves with are obviously lifeboats. They are not made to last. They are made to carry us to a certain point in the life of the earth and we are now there or we are within 20, 30, 40, 50 years of confronting the transcendental object at the end of time that drew us out of the animal body. History is the proof and the shock wave of the eschaton. This is a hard thing for secular audiences to wrap their minds around because they're familiar with hearing this from rattlesnake handling Christers. But that's simply because religion has always been the repository of the irrational intuition. It never said that the irrational intuition is ipso facto false. It becomes a travesty when hung with the uh, trappings of dogma derived through the scholarly revelation of weasels. But the intuition, the intuition is pristine and the intuition of Islam, Judaism, Christianity, and cults innumerable is that there is a finiteness to the historical experience. And then the more staid the ontology, the further into the future they put it so they can continue trading real estate uh, for the next little while. I think that it is now possible to extrapolate the curves that describe our degradation of the planet, the spread of epidemic diseases, the ozone hole, the extraction of metals, the clearing of the rainforest, the rise of population, the spread of uh, toxic compounds, so forth, to see, to convince yourself, even from a rational point of view, that history is a self-limiting process. Well, if you're a rationalist, then you must conclude we're just headed for extinction. I would think then the rational response to that logical process would be to get your ass in gear and try and avert the, distinction, the extinction. And if you're not a rationalist, then the conclusion you draw from all that is that uh, we are within striking distance of merging with the mysterious hyperspatial source of our intelligence and that somehow this is a planetary birthing, something as scripted as the breakup of Pangaea or the movement of glaciers south from the pole. It's just part of the process. A culture exists to transform mind out of the domain of matter. We are rising toward the rarefaction of ourselves into uh, the transcendental plasmate body of alchemical and Buddhist uh, uh, preoccupation. This is what is calling us out of matter. 
It's what called the monkeys out of animal organization. It's what calls technology out of the restless hands of the hominids. And it is what is calling all of us toward a kind of fusion with the community, with the psychedelic totality of the species, and with the larger Gaian totality of the planet. This is what it all went for. This is the promise and the redemption of history. Without this redemption, then history becomes the abortion that materialists fear it is. This is why the legitimate path to the transcendental, the linking of the individual with the transcend transcendental through psychedelics, now becomes the most important political work that can be done in the light of the rising awareness of the end of history. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching that video. Please leave me a comment and let me know what you thought about that clip. And please remember to like this video and subscribe for more.